Hi everyone, welcome. This is gonna be a brief video providing a crash course in LaTeX and BibTeX using Overleaf. Right? This is not meant to be comprehensive. Uh, a lot of what you need to learn to get good at this is gonna require looking things up, pulling up examples, getting a little bit of practice. Um, however, I'm gonna show you a bunch of um, essentials, okay? Uh, based on this list here, we'll go into those more uh, momentarily, but we'll start off with just some of the fundamentals being like, well, what is LaTeX? Right, what is LaTeX? Here's the key idea, right? Let's compare this to if you were using a tool for writing a paper such as Microsoft Word, okay? Um, Microsoft Word as an example was often referred to as a what you see is a what you get editor, okay? Uh, and what we mean by that, that big, sometimes people use this like big long acronym for that is that what you're, when you're writing say a paper doing something like that in Word, what you see on the screen when you're editing the document is the same thing that is gonna be printed out, the end result, right? There's no separation of the style uh, versus the actual content, right? You're looking at just like what it's gonna look at when you go ahead and you, and you print out the document, right? Or, or make a PDF of it or whatever you're gonna do, okay? Now that's in contrast to something like LaTeX. Right, where the key idea is we're separating content from style. Okay, content is what you're writing, your text, right? It's your thoughts, right? Your, your sentences, your paragraphs, as well as maybe any figures you have, if you've got equations, math, right? All of that content, right? That's the hard part, right? We wanna separate that from the style, margins, fonts, maybe if you have single columns versus double columns, right? And the idea here is if we separate the content from the style, right, it makes it very easy to change the style based on requirements that might come up, right, um, and that you can just you focus on developing good content and the style can be dealt with separately. You could even pull in professional templates that help make a really nice professional looking document, which is effectively what we're gonna do in here. All right, and because of this, this ends up being very handy um, especially makes things a lot easier in terms of being able to um, not only create professional looking diagrams, but it also tends to be quite helpful for uh, mathematics in particular. And uh, this is why over, it's been around a long time, over many decades, it's really become a standard tool for writing papers and engineering mathematics and, and the hard sciences, okay? Um, so it's really helpful, it's used very frequently, it's, it's um, extremely popular in those circles, okay? And it used to be that to um, to use LaTeX, you had to download some tools and you had to kind of go through some hoops, right? But we're fortunate now that there it's made a lot easier with some more recent developments. And so we're gonna use a tool called Overleaf, right? And Overleaf is a cloud-based tool, okay? That I'm actually pulled up right here. So this is an example of Overleaf. Uh, and actually inside of a version of a report. And Overleaf, as I mentioned, it's web-based. You don't have to install anything. Uh, it's also really helpful, the fact that you can have, you can collaborate, you have multiple people on a team collaborating on one paper simultaneously, so that's an additional benefit. Um, and as you can kind of see just by looking at, at just taking a look at, I've got a, a dot tech file open, that it looks somewhat like writing code, although don't get intimidated by it, it's actually quite simple, right? And we could see that there's, what effectively we're looking at is the content, right? Like so say like the abstract here of a paper, okay? And the end result of this is we effectively compile. I'm gonna hit this recompile button here, see compiling, is we're gonna take all of the content that was written right, with some styling information that's provided, and it's gonna generate a PDF as the end result, okay? So notice it's a, it's it's not, like when we're looking at the actual document, okay, we might just be looking at, say, some text and some information about, um, and it's different than how it actually is going to get uh, presented and create that final PDF, okay? So there's some styling information that's that's being included here. And actually this .cls file here is defining the style that we're using. We're using an IEEE standard, okay? 
to in terms of how we're we're um, organizing the, the final document. Okay, so let's go into some of the, the basics. Uh, I'm going to show you first on this report.txt file. This is kind of the heart of the uh, of the document. Okay, and I'm including a bunch of sections here, an impact section, maybe a related work section, maybe your system requirements, system design, etc., uh, as well as an abstract. Okay, and under each one of these sections, this is providing a header. Right, a section header, so we can actually go to the PDF here and we could see the name of the header here, section one, okay, and section two, et cetera. We'll do the numbering for you. Um, and then it's inputting a .tech file for each one of those sections, right? This is, tends to be a pretty handy way of organizing the content, right, is everything that's in this section is now breaking, broken out into a separate file, okay? So there's not much in here, it's like a paragraph, all right, we have the text related to that um, to that that particular section. All right, we come back here. We could look at the prior work section. All right, prior work dot uh, tex. Right, here's our prior work section. We can define subsections as well. Right, again, it will do all the the um, numbering for you. Okay, and one of my favorite things personally about using LaTeX is you can put comments in here, right? So maybe you've got a paragraph and you want to say, hey, you know, I'm going to do this percent is the is a comment. Um, we make some comments saying, hey, need need to proofread paragraph or whatever comments that you want, and these will not show up um, in the when you actually render the PDF. Okay, so the comments is very helpful. You make notes to yourself or your teammates. I find that is extremely useful to do. The other thing is um, I would recommend there's times that you're kind of debating, maybe including some text, including some sentences. One style I would recommend doing is having every sentence as its own line. Okay, Every sentence being its own line. And then if you want to comment out a sentence, you could just simply comment it out. Right. So this way, if you're having sentences that you're not, you may have a general idea of what you want to convey, but maybe it's not finalized yet. Right. Or you're you're thinking of taking something out, but you're not really sure if you want to remove it yet. You have that ability just to comment it out. And I honestly think that's one of the most powerful things about using LaTeX, just from my own personal standpoint. It allows you to kind of work through your thoughts um, versus in Word or something. You just delete it and it's gone, um, and it might be hard to. You know, you can kind of now you can still keep everything together and put comments uh, as you're working through your thought processes and editing and proofreading the document. Okay, so I would highly recommend doing that. Um, in addition, if we look back at our list here, right? So I was kind of talking about some of the best practices. Another extraordinarily helpful thing related to um, using this tool is it integrates something. Overleaf is integrating in something called BibTeX. Right for standing for bib, standing for bibliography, basically your citations. Okay, so I have a .bib file, citations.bib, and in here I've got some sample um, citations. Okay, there's some sample citations, and let me just show you an example of how to add a citation. All right, I'm going to go to Google Scholar. Okay, I'm going to go to Google Scholar. I'm going to look up someone famous like Alan Turing, for example. All right, so, and I'm going to just, you know, let's do it by, there's a lot of articles. He's obviously a super famous person. Um, I'm just going to grab some sort of, it doesn't really matter what it is. I'm going to just grab one of his articles. Um, here's one from 1937. Um, and what's really common that you'll find if you look through these articles, right, um, but here I'm actually finding the, the PDF, et cetera. But you can also often uh, find the um, BibTeX file for it, okay? And actually that one's pretty old. Maybe I'm not seeing it in that one. But it's really, really common is if I grab one of these um, documents, right? So here I'm, you know, I clicked on an, uh, one referring to the imitation game. And I see something here called um, export citation, 
right? I've got, I could pull up the BibTeX uh, information right here, okay? And so if I do that, here is the, the citation. And notice we have a similar idea that we're separating the content from the style, right? It's not really fun dealing with a lot of different citation styles, right? Um, what's great about this is we can include this information, right, this citation. I can come back to Overleaf. I'm going to include this citation here, right? And I might, um, I'm just going to, this top, this f right here, it's a, this is the name of the citation that we're going to use. You can call this anything meaningful um, that you would like. Okay, this must be some reprint of some earlier work by Turing because he wasn't alive in 2006, right? Not by a long shot. But um, I'm going to copy that citation. Okay, and now I can cite this in, you know, anywhere I want in the paper. Okay, if I come back to, let's say, go maybe in the prior work section, I have some examples of citations in here. Um, I'm just going to put something in like here is some work by Alan Turing. Okay, and if I use this cite command with that name of the citation. Okay it's going to cite this for me, okay? I like doing the, you need the slash cite. I like putting the um, the little tilde there. It just helps with the spacing when you render it. If, it. if it will force it that if the citation goes on to the next line with the, it, it will kind of connect all this together, the, the last name, or in this case, the, the last word with the, um, with the citation, it will force them to be kind of linked together. So they'll go on to a new line together, but that, that's a minor point. So I'm going to hit PDF here. Uh, let's compile it. Let's take a look. Right in the related work section, we can see here is some work by Alan Turing. And I made it as a separate paragraph. All right, notice it's using four. Right, four. I go down here. And the references, here it is cited. Okay. And if I wanted to change the citation format, I could do that in one location. Right. Right here, I'm defining actually the style. It's an IEEE transaction style, okay? But you could use a different style, okay? Change it all in one spot, makes it nice and easy. Okay, so that's the kind of crash course using citations, BibTeX, okay? Um, let's take a look at maybe one, another, actually, I'm gonna show you figures first, then we'll look at tables. Uh, for figures, Here's an example of including a figure. Uh, let me just see where it is in the document. Actually, it's in the design section. Here's an example. I would recommend, um, you know, this is something that you often will just um, Google and pull up what the, what the proper commands are here. Okay. Uh, here's a figure. It's saying begin figure. This here, system arc. Right, that's the name of the file. Notice there's a system arc.png file here. Okay, I would recommend being doing something consistent, like using a, a PNG file in terms of the the um, the file extension. Okay, um, you can include captions for what you want underneath the figure. Okay, and I this is one this is a, a common thing that confuses people related to LaTeX. When I include the figure. It's um, a suggestion of where it should be included, right? So this is this is a subtle point. This is saying, hey, I would like the figure to be somewhere after this, but before this stuff, okay? However, when you actually render or compile the document, okay, the figure is going to get placed in whatever location um, seems reasonable to the LaTeX software. So it it tries to follow a certain kind of proper formatting guidelines, like maybe having the figure at the top left, for instance, or somewhere where it's kind of a um, nice and well organized, um, like one of the like one of the corners or something of the document. Um, so it's not very literal, right? And I think that is a very subtle point. For instance, the figure does not necessarily need to be after this word, a figure in LaTeX. Okay, and if we come back here, let's see if that actually, in this case, it actually is not, right? Let's see, it says functionality, 
then there's the document and the figure in LaTeX is not till here. So notice it put the figure above that, okay, before you actually read this, All right? It just because it's trying to follow proper um, kind of, it's trying to help you by having the, the figure be placed somewhere that's a very reasonable place to include it, okay? It, you know, that's the type of thing that if you don't like what it's doing, you kind of mess around with placing it. And there are some little tricks in LaTeX that I want to get into now that you can kind of improve that and, and fix that up. Right. The other thing, one of my favorite things is notice I'm saying here, see figure one, see figure one. Okay. It's referring to this figure one. Okay. Do not hard code. Don't hard code any of these uh, references to the numbers. Instead, you're going to do something like this. Here I gave it a label, right? And I said, I have, I want to label the figure and I'm going to give it a name. Right? And then I can use this reference command that will replace this reference here. Okay, we'll place this reference here, okay, with that number. Okay, so if you have multiple figures, that's nice because if you have, you know, if you're adding figures, deleting figures, right, the numbers will get updated automatically. You could do this for C figure one, C, you know, you could also be like C section three, right? Whatever the section is, you just got to define which the label identifies that that's what you're referring to, say that figure or that section, okay? And then this will replace it with the proper number, okay? So usually the convention is that before the colon, you're specifying what type of thing, number you're using. Is it a figure? Is it a section? Is it a table? Okay, whatever whatever it is you want to enumerate. All right. So that's that's quite quite handy. Uh, if you want a figure to straddle across the entire, like this report here has two columns, right? Which I think, in my personal opinion, looks quite nice. I kind of like the double column um, look. I think it looks very professional. Just a personal opinion. Um, if you here the figure is just using one corner, right, half the page. If you want it to straddle across both columns, the common question I've I've gotten from students, you can do that quite easily. You just put a little asterisk here after the word figure. It has to be done twice, here, and here. Okay. If I re-render it, right, I recompile it. Give it a second. And where is it now? The figure is actually on another page because it's taken up a lot of it's resize to take up quite a lot of room, right? But that could be really important, right? If you've got a lot of detail in your figures and you want to make sure people can read it and see it, you're going to want to, you know, you're, there's times you're going to want figures to straddle across multiple columns. It just depends on what you're, you're illustrating, okay? All right, so coming back to our list of topics here. So we've talked about what LaTeX is, Overleaf, some best practices, citations. We talked about figures and labels. Let's just do a little quick thing with related to tables, okay? Um, I would recommend always looking at some notation for this or like some documentation. Here's some documentations for creating a table, right? Right from the Overleaf page. This is right from the Overleaf documentation, okay? Um, right, if I go in here, this is gonna create a, what we're looking at related to this document here is we're centering a table, we're defining a table, right? It's got three columns. And then here is each row, okay? The double slashes here represent going to the next line, okay? Sometimes that's helpful. If you want to force going to the next line, slash, slash will do that. The ampersands separate the cells, right? So we've got row one here, right? Cell one, cell two, cell three, okay? If I go ahead and let's recompile this, We can see, where is my table? There it is. Here's my table, okay. So one thing you might notice by looking at this table is in this case, we don't have any uh, vertical lines or horizontal lines. We can, we can certainly add those if that's what we're, our goal is. Vertical lines, really simple. We're just gonna put them between how we define the columns. Like if we want them between, like maybe not on the outer edges, but just between the columns, we can go ahead and do that. Right, I recompile it, puts the vertical bars here where, where we specified them, okay? We could also do horizontal lines too, if that's what you want. I believe it's just H line, 
wherever we want. Okay, let's make sure I did that right. Recompile, right? We got the horizontal lines wherever we want them as well, right? And you could look at the documentation. There's there's tons of examples depending if you're looking for something particular. If you want to double horizontal lines, right? Um, there's all sorts of different changes and things that you can do related to this, right? Um, if you wanted to make, uh, if you wanted to bold the like column headers, you could do txt bf, right? For I believe that's the command for making it bold, bold font. Okay, and notice it's now it's bold. So if these were going to be the headings, okay, the headings. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about then is just to talk a little bit about math and, and equations. So this is a big advantage of using tech is because of this. It's super helpful to be able to manage math, uh, to be able to put equations in here. I'll just make some space here. Um, one way to do it, the kind of shorthand way, is if you want to have an equation and you want it to be centered, you put the math between two um, double dollar signs. Right, so if I had something like this, E equals MC squared, right? This is gonna make it in a style, like a math style, right? And it, it provides a whole bunch of um, math-oriented functions and characters with the caret being the exponent symbol, okay? If I go ahead and recompile this, right? We're gonna have that somewhere in the document now, where if I can find where I put it. Here it is, right? It's nice and centered, right? Notice it's in italics, so it's in kind of a math kind of style, okay? There's all sorts of like, I could spend a ton of time going about all the different types of functions and things that are included in here. Um, but there's a, the most important, like there's anything from using Greek symbols to being how to do fractions, integrals, whatever it happens to be. What I would mostly uh, recommend is you looking through, in this case, I've got open the overleaf document um, and you can go and you can look up right how to do certain things right whatever the symbols whatever it just depends on what you need okay right summation etc um, there's there's too many to show all at once and it's not really necessary okay but the key thing is you want it in those um, double dollar signs okay you could also use if you wanted to just have the uh, not centered on like a new line. If you were saying something like the C symbol is the constant for the speed of light, or you, you're doing some sort, you're, you're referencing a symbol or something, and you're referencing some um, property in your um, in your text. Right, and you want it to be in the proper mathematics style, you would just do a single dollar sign. Okay, so if we did that and I recompiled it, okay, in this case, notice the C is italics and looks in the same kind of font. All right, so that's how to properly do it like inside of your document. Okay, the other thing you could do, depending on what you want, it's, is you could also say begin equation. Right? It's really the same idea as these dollar, uh, double dollar signs, except this kind of allows you to do things like if you want captions, if you want ways of, just like we did with the figure, um, you know, you have you could have multiple, obviously you have multiple lines here and things like that. But if you wanted to do something similar like we did with the figure where you're having a caption and a label for it, you can certainly do that based on this type of notation. Okay, but effectively in this example, it's the same idea. Okay, recompile it. We're just going to get two of the same things. All right. Notice there's, you know, we're getting it's referencing the one. The one caveat is referencing the the line number for it. Okay, which can be helpful for in your text if you want to refer back to particular lines. All right. So this is meant to be a crash course, not meant to be comprehensive. Right, I, it, the documentation is important. It's important to be able to look things up um, as you're going along. And if you get stuck with anything, feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, keeping in mind that usually, as you kind of go through this, it gets a little bit of hands-on practice. It tends to uh, come together. Right, you can get compile errors just like if you were coding. 
right? Most of the time that's related to forgetting something like, uh, if we go back into the document here, if you're forgetting like an end equation or something that you're not closing a particular block, right? You're or forgetting a curly bracket or something, you, you would cause the uh, program not to compile successfully. All right. Uh, looks actually in this case, I tried to break it and it looked like it still kind of figured out what we wanted, right? But you could still, you can get those, um, you can get those compile errors. Actually, you could see that right here, right? Missing, um, right? It's telling you that something's wrong. Um, and anyway, so there's times that you're, you're, you won't be able to actually render it in a PDF if you have those mistakes, right? Obviously deal with those as they come about. If you get stuck, we'll, we'll assist you, okay? But I think you will find if you use the tool properly that it's actually quite powerful and can save you a lot of time uh, in the long run. So thanks for watching, have a good day, and feel free to reach out to us with any questions that you might have.